Okay, folks, I think we're going to get started with our last presentation before lunch. And uh, this is called Diversifying Your Livestock Enterprises with Multiple Species. And I'm here this morning to introduce Jace Doan. And uh, pleased to have Jace with us this morning. Uh, part of the Black Leg Ranch uh, operation. And uh, I've known Jace since he was a, 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 a wee lad, just kind of like how I knew Justin. Uh, actually, I probably knew Jace or knew of him even before, before that when he was small. And Jay used to pick on him a lot, I'm sure, but not so much anymore. But, but uh, anyway, we're pleased to have him talk. Uh, if you know anything about the Doan Ranch, uh, you know, you've heard about the stacking the enterprises, uh, the multiple species things that they have going on. Uh, they're a busy group, uh, if you will. Uh, they got a lot of good things uh, going on. Uh, Jace specifically, I think, handles, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, handles a lot of the livestock enterprise part, and I think that that's what he's going to be talking about uh, this morning because uh, <clears throat> took it, I had got some advice one time too, you, you only talk about what you really know about, but uh, never wander into that other stuff, Jay, that you don't know about, right? True. So, but, uh, and I think Jace is gonna talk about the multiple species livestock. So with that, uh, please help me welcome Jay Stone. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, as Daryl said, I'm Jay Stone, Black Lake Ranch. Um, that's my wife, Cassie, and our three children. My oldest at the bottom just turned three yesterday, and the other two are going to turn one in a, in a couple weeks. So we got our hands full. See, Daryl, cut away. No. You want to dance it? No, I won't. Okay. I got it. Um, our place sits in south central North Dakota, kind of on the bordering of, it's hard if you guys can see. On the border of those two counties, Burley and Emmons, um, not too far off the Missouri River. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of changes in the landscape, I guess, from really sandy soils to uh, to some rougher terrain. Traditionally, we were a pretty conventional operation. Um, we calved in barns. We don't really do that anymore. Uh, one year, Dad lost 100 calves to scours and, and pneumonia. And uh, I didn't really have any pictures from, from way back then, but we did buy some, some cows that we had to calve in the barn, so I'll get some pictures. But <laughs> this is both last, last winter, I guess, and I got a herd of longhorn coriander cows, and I kind of baby them so they get special treatment in the barn. But. We all remember last winter, and why we uh, why we switched is this was April 14th, and that's what it looked like in front of my house. And uh, you know, it wasn't very fun if you were even if I mean April 14th. There's still a lot of people calving in April. I I still calve our big cows roughly around that time. And to think of what could survive in that weather is kind of amazing. Um, That's what we were dealing with. Little calves in a little barn with a big diesel powered heater going on them, trying to keep them alive. And obviously we couldn't save everything. <laughs> so why do we calve in those conditions and the muck and slop and put those animals through that? How can we change to increase our profitability and our quality of life? Seven most expensive words in the cattle business, we've always done it that way. How many people continually do things that their grandpa or their great grandpa did or their dad did and they can't get them to change?
So what we changed, we moved the calving date back. Ideally, we calve like the first of May. Um, it doesn't always go that way, we calve in, in April. And I'm fine with that, especially on a year like this, not so much today, but uh, I'd be fine calving in February this year. Um, get animals out on range and out of the slop and muck. You know, you saw those pictures of them calves, and those were two calves that we lost out of countless calves. And I don't want to go through that. The stress on ourselves was, was greatly decreased, um, having to constantly put calves in the shop with a heater on. They don't do good. They, their lungs get shot, and we'll probably end up losing them in the fall. Stress on the animals, um, decreased sickness, decreased dystocia. I'm not <coughs> saying that a cow that you're going to have to pull, you're not going to have to pull if you calve later. But if she's out on the range, you're not going to have much opportunity to pull her. So you increase the dystocia based upon you, uh, you really don't know what happened to her. So you're not going to intervene, I guess. We do pull calves out on the range. Um, if they're real far along, you just throw a rope around them, tie them off, and those cows can't really move anyway. And so a lot of times they'll let you come up with a calf puller and pull them. We don't have a real big problem with that, though. Let animals work for us. We try not to work for the animals. What can we do to further enhance our profitability within the livestock sector? Uh, winter grazing, that's huge. And if any of you just listened to Christoph's talk, you, you got to hear all about winter grazing. I just caught the tail end of it. But I'm sure he talked a lot about using cover crops and, and different outlets to, to decrease your, your hay costs. Um, my dad figures are if we can graze our cows through the winter, we'll save $300 a head average um, without feeding them. And that's huge. You know, if you're dealing with 500 cows times 300 head, that's a lot of money that you can save. What else do we do? Um, smaller frame cows. Typically, in North Dakota, people have 14, 1500 pound cows, big sim cross cows. And there's nothing wrong with that if that fits your your uh, your ranch's plan. It doesn't fit for us in winter grazing. Those cows would go backwards on, on winter grazing. So we try to get 1,200 pound cows. Not all of them are 1,200 pounds. Some might be 11, some might be 1,350. Ideally, they'd be 1,200. High intensity, short duration grazing. Um, that comes in the summer with rotational grazing. If we can increase our stocking density, increase pounds per acre instead of pounds per animal, um, that just increases our, our bottom line. Lower inputs. We don't AI anymore. We don't deworm our cow herd. We don't, um, we're still doing a lot of things. We still tag, we still PG, we still do a ton of different things. But just finding the balance for what works for your operation on, on what you could do to, uh, to lower your inputs, whatever that might be. So how could we go even further? We had been exploring the ideas of grazing sheep with the cows. And uh, we just tossed it around and I knew very little. I went to some talks like this and listened to some people and still didn't really know what I was doing. And so we thought, let's just buy some to, to figure it out. So pros of adding sheep to the current cattle operation. I've heard you can graze five sheep to every cow. I listened to Annie Carlson's talk. She said 10 sheep to a cow, and I don't know if that's on the same basis. I've heard in different areas one sheep to a cow. I, I don't know. But we went with the rule five sheep to every cow without any difference in stocking density on your cow because each species is impacted, or sorry, that's different, but um, because each species grazes different things. So cows forage on one thing, sheep on a different thing. The other benefits, they're impacted by different parasites. I'd always heard when I was little that you throw a, a sheep or a goat in with your horse because they'll pick up a disease before the horse will. And if you've got a really expensive horse, then you'd rather the sheep die before your horse. <laughs> Um, increased carrying capacity. 
I guess just as far as a, a, adding more more animals on, on that uh, on that land, you increase the range quality because if if the sheep will eat spurge or, or whatever in different times of the year, the buck rush that, that the cows won't eat, then that just better's your your range quality. Added revenue at slow times of the year. Traditionally, people sell their calves in the fall after they wean, or they background them and sell them in the spring, or or whatever. If uh, if sheep's gestation periods are five months, and you can grow that sheep up, however many days it takes to get a mature mature lamb or weather, then uh, that's just added revenue at different times when you might not have it. I bought Katahdin hair sheep. I wanted to buy wool sheep. My dad said there's no shears left in the area, and it's hard to get people to come shear them, and he didn't want to do it, even though he was really good at shearing my 4-H sheep. <laughs> so we bought hair sheep. I thought that wool was just another avenue for income. I've also heard as of late that it costs more to pay the shear than it does, or than, than you'll get returned for your bags of wool. So, you know, I know a lot of people are stockpiling their wool. I don't know what what the right answer is with that, Annie Carlson was saying that a lot the market is becoming really um, inundated with a lot of hair sheep, and so they're not desirable right now to packers. I don't know. Bowman Livestock Marketing on February 5th, a 100-pound lamb was bringing $200 to $200 a head, 200 to 210 So this is just in a perfect case scenario, no inputs figured in. But if you had 100 cows and graze 500 ewes, you should have 500 lambs, roughly, considering twins and death loss. And uh, I know there's a lot of death loss with sheep. <laughs> right now, 500 head times 200 bucks, 100 grand, without any change to grazing impact. That's a perfect case scenario. I know there's a lot of things that go into that. But that was my thinking getting into this. What we tried. I bought. 40 ewes and two bucks. I went down to Harry Livestock, met some guy in the parking lot, we backed up trailers and swapped them over. They came out of Eureka, South Dakota, I think. And he tried to tell me that the white sheep were so much more desirable than the colored ones. I thought the colored ones were a lot cuter. But that's just what he said. So I brought them home and uh, stuck them in with the cows just in a corral and I had to push up dirt on the sides to make sure these things didn't crawl underneath and what what 4-H panels and hog panels I had lying around I kind of fixed up the rest of the crawl with. And them cows ran those sheep around that pen as fast as they could for an hour. And I thought, oh my god, I just killed all my sheep. <laughs> they were all panning, sitting in the corner, the cows were stomping them, didn't know what to do. I said, well, they got to kind of serve their purpose, so let's just see what happens. And then the negative started. <laughs> so my mom bought me these. Two donkeys. There's three there. Rude. That's my brother. So. Uh, she, these donkeys came off the reservation in Arizona for whatever reason. Somebody had them at Kist and she got them for like 50 bucks a piece. So we turned the lambs out with the donkeys into the cows. And I guess prior to this picture being taken, I put those donkeys in the corral with the sheep, and they were fine for a little while, and then I heard a bunch of yapping one day. And my brother, my other brother, has hunting dogs, and I went down there, and about 20 of my sheep had holes in their necks, and they were just killing for fun. And so that constituted me turning them out quicker than I wanted to because I didn't think that they were ready. But I turned them out and they, they liked the donkeys, but the donkeys didn't really care for them. And so my donkeys were in one corner of the pen and the dogs and the sheep were in the other just having a massacre parade. <laughs> I've heard that, uh, after, again, I didn't know anything my mom bought me two donkeys. I guess you're only supposed to get one because then the donkeys will bond to the sheep, not to themselves. They were cool out there for a while. My 40 head sheep operation turned to like 20, but 
They were cool out there. And they bonded okay. And the cows seemed to quit trying to kill them. Then they started wandering, showing up at the neighbors, disappearing for days, and would not bond to the cows. I don't have sheep fence anymore. All the woven wire fence was taken out years ago. I have four strand barbed wire perimeter fence that if the sheep were older, maybe they wouldn't be able to get under, but they could. And I drive down by Faith or Newell, South Dakota, and I see these sheep grazing with these cows, and they're all in barbed wire fences. And I think, well, how did they do it? But I couldn't figure it out. And then people say, well, you've got to buy electric netting and yada, yada, yada. Well, that's a huge expense that I didn't really want to undertake. They, we have two wire, bar, or two wire electric interior fences. They would hit the electric and just go right underneath. They didn't, they didn't care about it. During our short experiment, we decided to try another experiment. And we bought buffalo. I bought five bred heifers and a bull. They were two years, two years old, coming on three, to cab at three, and uh, they come out of Strasbourg. My dad said that that was the first time we've ever had a 100% calf crop, because all five of them <laughs> have no problems, and they all five live. Again, I had no idea anything about buffalo. I just thought they were cool. We went and toured a couple places. I joined a couple associations, and it was between two guys. One had hornless buffalo. He had them all dehorned. I thought they looked weird, and so we bought these. Initially, I was able to kick them out on range with using just old cow fence. And a lot of old cow fence is just three strand barbed wire surrounding a crop field. That's what a lot of North Dakota is. And they stayed in it just fine at that age. No. And that's a little little better fence, but you know it's it's not anything special, not anything big. Just four wire, newer barbed wire fence that is. But they were calving out there, and our five turned into I think twenty pretty fast. And uh, I had no problems that first year. I mean, we're we're all familiar with the benefits of the buffalo as far as them being hardy and acclimated to this environment. I heard today when I was leaving the house, I saw them. And they were out on a on corn stubble and they were staring head first into the wind. I mean, they're suited for our environment a lot better than a lot of other species are. For me, the benefit was that they're bovine. They're a ruminant. I was familiar with cattle, um, so I figured a buffalo shouldn't be any different, realistically. They calve on their own. If they have any calving problems, you let nature do its thing. Um, if you have to pull a calf, you're just going to let it die because you can't you can't dart them. They'll die from the adrenaline. You can't give them enough xylazine or whatever to, to calm them down. They'll just end up dying. You can't rope them around the neck because they have windpipes and you go crush their windpipe. Um, no barns or windbreaks needed. Like I said, staring head first into the wind. I remember from college in a college ecology class that why buffalo stare head first into the wind is because they have big shoulders and a small butt. And as the wind circulates around their body, it creates these warm air pockets. I don't understand the science of it, but that's why quarter horses stare with their butt into the wind, because they have big rump and small shoulders. Same concept, I guess. Long reproductive life. I haven't been in the business long enough to see it but I've heard of people having 20-year-old cows that have calved every year since they were three. And that's awesome to me. You know, the beef cows, a lot of them are culled out by 10 years old. And I thought that a 20-year-old buffalo would be pretty cool. I mean, she'd pay for herself several times over during her life from all the offspring that she'd have. This is the current USDA monthly bison report. And they come out with one once a month. It's not like the cattle. Beef cattle slaughters 50,000 head a day. There's 50,000 head of buffalo in the United States. So, I mean, it, it just kind of puts things into perspective. Young bulls less than 30 months of age dress right now at like 
well, let's say you slaughter them at, at 1,000 pounds or whatever. So their carcass weighs 600, four bucks a pound hang weight. Considering buffalo eat one third less than a beef cow, which is what I've heard, I haven't been able to prove that, and I don't know if people lied to me when I was getting into the business or what. <laughs> but if I were to really try it, they probably could. A traditional 100 head beef operation could graze theoretically 133 buffalo, 60 bulls, give or take, you know, you might have a few more, but fit, roughly 50%, sell at 1,000 pounds, roughly 6% carcass weight, 600 pounds. So 600 times four bucks is $2,400 a head for a finished animal. Right now, the beef industry is pretty lucrative. I mean, you could probably buy a 1,000 pound beef animal, or sell a 1,000 pound beef animal at, at a sale barn for, you know, maybe not 2,400, but you'd be pretty close to that. So right now, it might seem like an unfair comparison just because the beef um, markets so high. This is what my fences kind of look like now. I hate electric fence, uh, but buffalo do too. And so I have seven foot posts, five barbed wires with an electric jumper on the bottom. And knock on wood, they have not bothered that. They just despise electric fence. And honestly, they haven't bothered I had one horse scored by a buffalo, but I wasn't on it. But other than that, they don't really bother horses. Obviously, I'm on the other side of the fence. But. <laughs> do you ever ride a mother in the ice in a, with a horse? I do, yeah, I do quite a bit. Generally, they run away, especially right. if they're calving. But other than that, I mean, they'll come up. And it all just, with buffalo, it's all on how you manage them. If I heard a story that somebody said, well, I know my buffalo cows go 35 miles an hour. And I said, well, that's kind of an odd stat to know or document. He said, well, it's because at 36, I hit him. <laughs> so obviously, his animals were pretty wild with how he was managing them. I don't do that. I had no idea buffalo and sheep couldn't be anywhere near each other. And maybe found that out the hard way. I don't know. But we bought some bulls out of Nebraska, and they were genetically pure buffalo. <coughs> Apparently, you, I, I don't know the percentage, but X amount of X percent of buffalo have still have cattle DNA in them, and so these ones were genetically pure. And then I had the sheep next to them. Sheep are carriers of malignant cattle fever, which is like terrible, terrible to buffalo. And I guess elk and maybe maybe deer can be carriers too. But uh, it's really, really hard on buffalo. And so if they're within, I think it's even a couple miles, they can, they can become susceptible and die to it. One of these animals died right away. I don't know if he had something else. But he, uh, you know, that was 2,000 bucks out of the pocket right away. Negatives of buffalo, increased infrastructure. And it's very expensive. You know, seven foot steel posts are nine bucks a piece. And barbed wire, high tensile barbed wires, over 100 bucks a roll, and electric wire for high tensile at 1,000 feet or whatever, 1,000 foot rolls or whatever. You know, it's just super expensive to get into it all. Um, if you're trying to finish out Buffalo, it's virtually impossible to get kill slots. We're fortunate that New Rockford has a Buffalo processing plant halfway close to us. But if you're a new producer, you're not going to get in. I've had to take animals clear to Denver. Um, you can take them to like Wisconsin or Idaho Falls, or I guess Sturgis or Rapid City has a plant too. Um, but it's you got to kind of piggyback off somebody else. You can't treat them just like beef cattle. When the first time I weaned them, and I, I've had help from a guy that was very uh, experienced in buffalo, but. Beef cows, you'd cram them into an alley and you'd stand down there and you'd sort them off. These things, you do that and you would probably die. <laughs> Neighbors' perceptions, that was a big one. When I turned the buffalo out on the pasture, you wouldn't believe all the people that stop and take pictures. That's cool, but then when they're running through their yard, they think they're going to die and get killed. They're not that way. It's all how they find each other. And you can't force them to do something. If I try hard enough, I'll get my beef cows to do what I want them to do. 
if I try hard enough to get to Buffalo to do it, they'll end up three counties away. <laughs> How am I doing on time? You've got 15 minutes. All right. Um, kind of learned the hard way on things. When I couldn't keep the animals in, I had them in the lot. And then I was calving in the lot. And this was last April during the blizzards. And you have bum buffalo calves. One of, I think the one on the right I was able to save. The one on the left I wasn't. So now we have a pet buffalo named Babe. As hardy as they are, these were feeder buffalo. And as soon as they get any sort of sickness, if they go down like this, just cut your losses. I tried so many times to put it into it give it a shot of drax and put it under a heater throw it in a building they'll just die once they go downhill there's not a lot of saving increased infrastructure we built i don't know how many foot long uh, pipe fences um, all by ourselves which saved on the cost but it's still a huge cost i mean pipes gone considerably expense or higher in expense. It's come down a little bit, but at one point last year it was 100 bucks a stick, almost. Now my fences, they're all pipe races and everything. Buffalo, as soon as they hit a, I mean, they're so strong, once they hit a, a tie or a treated post, they're just gonna snap it. And then this is our huge alley. I probably went a little overboard, but after I had I mean, there was, there's been days where I've chased in my buffalo three times a day because I couldn't get them to respect the fence. And so when I was working them, I said, I'm, I want a system that they will never, ever get out of. So that's my dad at like six foot, one inch tall, or whatever he is, and that's my corral, which is like nine foot tall. You probably work elephants in it, it's probably a little overkill, but I wanted peace of mind. This was, weaning, I guess, and it works really well. Cows run down. Once they get a routine figured out, then they're pretty easy to manage. Uh, I bought a couple big bulls out of South Dakota, and I had them in the corral, and they were just fine. Not my new corral, the cow corral. And one day, they're not there anymore. So I went looking for them, and I found them down by the creek, down in a wheat field. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to do with them. I can't put them back in a corral. They seem to be content. There's enough food. There's enough water. They're not going to do anything. About a month and a half went by, and I checked on them a lot. But I probably didn't check on them for a week. And then I get a call from the sheriff. He said, we have a report that you might have a buffalo. And this is like 20 miles away where he was explaining. I said, uh, I hope not, but maybe. So we go down there, and this guy was just walking down the gravel road, heading back to South Dakota, and uh, I didn't know what to do. We had some four-wheelers in the trailer, and so we started chasing them, and we were in the middle of farm country. <clears throat> Finally found somebody's corral, and it had some guardrail around it, so luckily I was able to get him in the corral, and after he bounced around looking for a hole to jump out, for probably an hour as we were trying to make shift this corral into a loadout for this 2,500 pound buffalo. He decided he had enough and jumped. And then he started running through people's yards with little kids' toys laying around. We thought somebody was gonna get killed. We had to shoot him a lot, a lot of times <laughs> before he went down. It was a pretty, uh, eye-opening experience for us. Um, we had a lot of Nate, we had developed quite the crowd that came and watched that were driving down the gravel road. Somebody brought their tractor so that we could finish it all off. But initially we had, a, I think it was a 243 and he just shook off those bullets and flinched. I mean, it wasn't until this brother brought down a 7mm Ultra Meg that we were finally able to take him out. And we have it all on video. So. <laughs> But even after we start from when we started shooting until when he died, I mean, it was probably a three mile chase with 30 plus rounds. So, which species should we pursue? My sheep that were drifted over in the snowbank, or my buffalo that stare head first into the wind. 
I, shortly after that picture was taken with the sheep, I had, again, I didn't really know any better, and I started lambing like the first of April. And that was a lot of fun to me, because I thought they were really cute, but then the sheep, some of them were preemies, and I tried bottle lambs, and I didn't save one. And then out of the 20 lambs that I had left, considering some had twins, some had singles, everything, I think I ended up with maybe 23 lambs or something. And I lambed them in the barn because it was April and I was dumb and there was still, it was still snowing and blizzarding at times. There was fortunately a barn right there that I could run them into. Couldn't keep them in, bought electric netting. I would come home, all that shit would be gone, but there'd be one lamb stuck, wrapped in the electric netting, just getting zapped every two seconds. <laughs> So then I put them in another barn, and I said, we got to get rid of them, because this isn't fun. So that was the day we loaded out my, my sheep. And uh, I did miss them. They were a lot of fun. They were an experience. I said, as soon as I, I don't care about my time, I don't care about the resources I put in them, I want the money back that I had just in the animals, and I'm done. So that's what I did. I got exactly what I had into those four to use, and I sold them. So we decided to go with, head with the buffalo and do what it takes to make it successful. Now we have a lot of buffalo on feed at the feedlot. Um, they do really well. If they don't get a sickness or something, go through them. We have them right next to the cows and the feeder calves and all that, and they, they work really well in that aspect. Now that I have good fences, this was this winter, I can keep them out on range where they should be. You shouldn't have to feed your buffalo cows. They are acclimated to this environment. If you want them to have higher breeding percentages than everything, then you should probably supplement them a bit. But if you don't want to and you're strictly going off the least amount of inputs, you shouldn't have to. This is just buffalo and fog. I thought it was a cool picture. We have a direct marketing meat business where we sell our beef and our buffalo. It's worked really well. Buffalo's kind of a niche market. Um, the problem is it's, a, it's an expensive meat. And so a pound of beef burger right now at the supermarket, I don't know what it is, maybe seven bucks or something with high beef prices. A pound of buffalo at the supermarket is over double that. So it's trying to convince consumers to try it. That might just be a special occasion type of deal and, and they might you know, it's just hard building that customer base. And that's why the buffalo industry crashed at the beginning part of the century, too. Huge outlet for us is these buffalo hunts. After we messed up so bad on that one big bull, we figured out that you probably shouldn't shoot them in the head, you should shoot them in the heart. To take out these old bulls the most um, humane way, instead of trying to handle them and let them kill themselves in the corral by running into something, to do it like the Indians did it for a million years and shoot them out in the field. And these old bulls, once they get unruly, that's about the only way you can take care of them. So it's a huge outlet for us. It benefits us, benefits the hunter, and we can get a premium for it. It's great. In the end, has it been worth it? Well, diversification is key. We don't want to be at the beck and call of these commodity markets. If you're a corn farmer right now, you're probably not having much fun because corn's four bucks or below, whatever it's at, I don't even know. Um, right now it's good to be in the commodity market in the beef industry because beef's at an all-time high, cattle uh, numbers are at an all-time low, or at least in the last 70 years or whatever. So that's great, but it's still not good to have all your eggs in one basket. I will always be a cattleman at heart. I will never be a buffalo man, if that's worse. Um, I love cattle. It's where, where it'll, it's just good to kind of have different things and different avenues of income. I found an animal I don't have to wash 100% as long as my fence is good. I don't have to go out there when, when I'm calving my beef cows and watch my buffalo calves, or cows calf. I don't have to PG them. I don't have to wean them. I don't have to deworm them, do anything if I don't want to. Um, Less interference, no intervention, and a niche product. I kind of went through that. 
last April when we had those blizzards, the beef cows were all tucked behind 30 windbreaks. My buffalo cows were down tucked in the hills and grazing on a sorghum cover crop field. And I felt bad, and I went down after two days and took them a bale of hay, and of course they came, but they probably didn't eat it. And they were just fine. They were actually, I don't know if I have a picture of it, but they were calving at this time. They kind of, they're weird in that they can calve with nature. They can kind of sense when a storm's coming, and they'll hold off for a day or two and not calve if they think it's going to be really bad. And I've heard that from pretty much everybody that I've talked to in the buffalo business. Constantly learning. I said you can't rope them, but this was a blind buffalo and I had no other option. Kept jumping through all my fences and so I kind of snuck up on him and made sure I didn't get him around the neck and roped him. And then my pregnant wife was on top of the trailer and as I was trying to drag him in, <laughs> I had to have her shut the gate. That was quite the experience. So we do new things all the time and I'm still learning. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions for Jace? How do you feel, uh, like as far as the grass, do they, they eat different species than cows, or how do they treat in the rangeland? It's been pretty similar to the cows, um, you know, at different times of the year. And I don't have the buffalo as intense as I do with my beef cows, so I can kind of force my beef cows to eat things that they probably wouldn't. But different times of the year, they go after different things. Sometimes they'll eat buckrush, sometimes they'll eat cattails. It just kind of depends. I haven't noticed a real strict difference between one or the other, but I'm not saying that that's not present. They're just not hemmed down enough to, to really give it a good test. Have you tried working together? Yeah, last year, and I didn't touch on that, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, last year I had my beef heifers out, and they were in bigger pastures, um, some were as big as a section and a half, and some were as small as a half section. But uh, I kicked 70 or 80 um, two-year-old buffalo out with all them breeding heifers, and there was like 200 heifers out there. And uh, they intermingled some, but for the most part, they kind of kept their distance and they, they didn't, uh, didn't really bother. I was kind of worried that as they were breeding, maybe my beef bulls would go screw with them buffalo bulls or vice versa. And they really didn't. So I, I don't know if my conception rates were affected at all. I have no idea. I, them heifers haven't calved yet. I don't know if I'm going to have beef low. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so I, I think it, it was OK. But that's still to be determined, I guess. Beef low is actually a real big problem that they really shun, shun uh, in the buffalo industry. So. Any other questions? Half top trailer for the next time you get a rope one? Half top? Yeah, I'm not going in there with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. She can sit, sit up top of the trailer and drag them in again. <laughs> Probably won't be roping too many anymore. I've figured out a lot, and my fences are a lot better, but I figured out way better ways to manage them. It all, it, it's just a learning curve, and I think. I was a little naive at the beginning. I wanted to grow by 100 animals a year. And so in, we started in 2018 with the buffalo, and I wanted to have 1,000 by 2028. And I, there's just no way. After all the learning curves and trying to figure out and upkeep my fences and build new facilities and everything, um, there's just no way. I, I don't have enough time in the day or, or money in my pockets. So. Anything else? Anything else for Jason? Well, yeah. we're very close to lunch. Uh, 11.30 is our deal. Let's give Jason another round. Thank you.